Okay, what do you say we get started? Good morning. I'm Chad Nelson, and welcome to the Update Training Seminar. We're going to be looking at an old friend who has a new name. You've known this four-speed automatic overdrive transaxle as the Turbo Hydromatic 440T4 for the last few years. Well, it has a new designation. It's now called the Hydromatic 4T60. Now, the name may be different, but the unit is the same. There have been a number of improvements and modifications on this unit during the last five years. It's become one of the auto industry's premier transaxles. Now, of course, like any complex product, it can be a little tricky to work with sometimes. And that's why today I thought we'd do something a little different. Normally I stand up here and explain various new procedures and components related to the 4T60. But today, I want to take about, oh, just a few minutes and let you folks ask a few questions. We can discuss anything that you're concerned about. Uh, service, uh, diagnosis, system operation, maybe terminology. Feel free to ask anything related to the 4T60 and I'll do my best to answer it. So, who wants to go first? Anybody? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. I'm still a little confused about some of the terminology, like the double bump and the chuggle. Could you explain a little bit more of that? Sure, that's a real good place to start. A bump is defined as a sudden forceful application of a clutch or band. Now, it doesn't necessarily need to be harsh, but the customer may notice it. A double bump, as you might expect, are two bumps that occur in quick succession. It's like a false start and then a positive engagement. Bumps and double bumps are more common at the beginning of a shift or during initial engagement. An end bump occurs, obviously, at the end of a shift. Now, let's take a look at chuggle. Chuggle is a bucking or jerking condition similar to that feeling when you're towing a trailer. It's usually most evident after a shift has occurred and even more noticeable after the torque converter clutch has engaged. It's sometimes related to engine related problems like vacuum leaks, fuel or ignition system problems, or restricted exhaust. Uh, It's an avoidable irritant sometimes. I'll get back to shutter in a minute. Surge Surge is a repeated feeling of acceleration and deceleration, but it's less intense than chuggle. And flare is a slip. It's a quick increase in RPM accompanied by a momentary loss of torque, usually during a shift. Shutter is similar to chuggle, but is much more severe and rapid, and it also usually gets worse as the fluid gets hot. Let's look at three different types of shutter. Shift shutter, as the name suggests, occurs during upshifts, downshifts, or shifts from park or neutral into reverse or drive. Likely causes are over-aggressive band applications or grabbing clutch plates. Torque converter apply release shutter occurs only during TCC application or release. The primary causes are sticking TCC apply valves or regulator valves, internal leakage, or a mechanical problem with the TCC unit. And TCC crowd shutter occurs after the torque converter clutch is applied and the accelerator pedal is depressed slightly, crowding the engine. It can sometimes appear similar to engine chuggle. The main causes are leaking of fluid past turbine shaft or accumulator piston seals, the TCC solenoid O-ring, or the valve body gaskets. Now, I know this may be a little confusing now, but it'll get clearer as we go along. Any questions about these terms? Because it's important that you have a good handle on this terminology because it helps you communicate more effectively with the customer and pinpoint complaints. Okay, anybody got another question? Sure. Do you have any hints or recommendations for diagnosis? Yeah, I have three of them. First, always do a road test. Take the time to do a road test. Secondly, try to do it with the customer so that you can watch the driving habits and things like that. And thirdly, 
Try to do it early in the day before you're a mess. <laughs> now, I just happen to have a short videotape here that deals with preliminary inspections. And if I can get this machine to work today, here and play. And we'll hope that I got it hooked up right this time. And the answer is yes. Okay, the preliminary inspection is critical to properly di diagnose any trans problem because once the transmission is on the bench, it's too late for much diagnosis. So start by just looking the car over. Just walk around it. Now, once you've looked the car over, the next step is to check the transaxle fluid level and condition. Now remember, for this, the car should be on a fairly level surface. Remember also to let the transaxle warm up. The fluid should be too hot to touch at operating temperature in order for really accurate readings. Oh, and by the way, you may get an inaccurate reading if the car has been driven for a long time in heavy traffic. Now, once the fluid is up to operating temperature, set the parking brake, put your foot on the brake pedal, and then move the gear selector lever to each range for a few seconds and then back to park. Now what this does, it allows the fluid to flow into all hydraulic cavities. So once you've done that, and again going through each one, and then as I said, take it back to park, then you check the fluid level. Now the fluid level should be within the cross-hatched area of the dipstick and not above it. And remember, there should be no signs of burn fluid or contamination. And this is probably a good time to, to stop for a minute, and we'll talk about Dexron. Now, you all know that Dexron 2 starts out red in color, but turns dark very early in its life. Now, the dark color should not be confused with burnt fluid, which has a very distinctive odor. A milky or pink-colored fluid is a sure sign that it's been contaminated with engine coolant. Now, if you see this, don't go any further. The transaxle is going to have to be removed and repaired along with whatever caused the coolant leak. Now, of course, the same is true if you spot any signs of friction disk material or excessive metal particles in the fluid. Now, again, some of the very obvious things are just the, the fluid level. Uh, don't be afraid to, to touch it, feel it, see if there's any uh, material in there. And obviously, checking the level. If there's too much in there, you're going to have to drain some out. And if there's not enough, you're going to have to add some and just do it a little at a time so that you don't go overboard, then have to drain that back out. And the quick visual inspection and fluid check only take a few minutes. And if all looks good to this point, take a road test. Now, it's best if the customer can go along on at least part of the road test to help verify the complaint. If possible, even have the customer drive. And this allows the customer to demonstrate the complaint and it gives you a chance to observe the driving habits of the driver, which sometimes contributes to the complaint. And while you're on the road test, make sure you jot down any notes that uh, may help you later in your diagnosis. Um, try, to, try to take the, the driver on a variety of streets and through a variety of driving conditions. Now, you may want to perform a more extensive road test on your own, where you note shift points and other more detailed items on your checklist. Remember, the more data you collect on the road, the easier your diagnosis is in the service area. Now, here's another tip. If the complaint is chuggle, especially on small grades, compare the condition in both overdrive and manual third. If the condition is considerably worse in overdrive, the most likely cause is an engine-related drivability problem. Once you've collected all the road test data, continue the preliminary inspection. Now, it's very important to check engine performance, because sometimes a clogged fuel injector or a, a cracked spark plug or even a small vacuum leak can cause what appear to be transaxle problems. And as long as you're under the hood, check the throttle valve cable. With the engine off, gently lift the cable away from the transaxle housing. Now, you should feel a slight amount of travel against spring resistance. With the engine running, the cable should be taut. If the TV cable is slack, 
you probably have a problem with the throttle valve. Refer to your service manual for the proper procedures. Check for any signs of fluid leakage or damaged wiring or even kinks in vacuum hoses. Now, it's also a good idea to check the manual linkage for proper adjustment. And when you're doing this, make sure you go through each position. Now, you may have to put the car on a hoist to complete the visual inspection. And you should check such things as engine mounts, uh, suspension parts, and transaxle mounting points, especially when the complaint involves excess vibration. Okay, a pressure test is usually a good idea. The pressure tap is right on top of the transaxle. Consult your service manual for details involving correct procedures and specifications. And don't rely on your memory. This stuff is complicated and varies from car to car. Well, obviously, this was just a quick review for most of you. But what I'd like you to remember is that the inspection only takes a few minutes, and it's something that you should do every time. OK, how about another question now? Ted, could you explain the operation of the torque converter clutch, especially the electrical circuit? Sure, I think we can do that. I think we have that technology. Now, let's see here. Yeah, this one. All right. Now, the torque converter clutch, which was first introduced in 1980, and as you know, the purpose of it is to provide a solid connection between the torque converter pump and the turbine during higher speeds and light load conditions. This improves fuel economy. And the mechanical operation is similar to that of a conventional clutch with a manual transmission, except the facing material is located inside the torque converter. Of course, the TCC system relies on the electronic control module, or ECM, for engagement and disengagement. The ECM receives signals from the vehicle speed sensor located in the transaxle governor housing, throttle position sensor, vacuum sensor, coolant sensor located on the engine, and hydraulic gear switches located in the transaxle valve body. And unless you've got the memory of an elephant, I suggest that you check the manual each time for information on testing these electronic components. Okay. Oops. Now let's see how I can work this out. Can everyone see that okay? Good. Okay. The TCC circuit gets its power from the brake light switch located at the brake pedal. The ECM provides the ground for the circuit, but only when it receives the proper signals from each of the input sensors. Once the clutch is engaged, if any of the input signals vary beyond preset limits or if the driver presses the brake pedal, the circuit is interrupted and the clutch disengages. The ECM also receives informational signals from the third and fourth gear pressure switches located in the transaxle valve body. These switches notify the ECM when a 2-3 or a 3-4 shift is happening. The ECM adds this information to the other input signals and can adjust engine and transmission performance accordingly. Let's take a look at those switches. This is the third gear pressure switch, and this is the fourth gear pressure switch. Now, each is calibrated to send an electronic signal to the ECM at a certain pressure during the shift. You can test these switches by removing them from the valve body, connecting an ohm meter or a self-powered test light to the terminals, and applying air pressure to the fluid end of the switch. The switch is normally open so you should get an infinite reading on the ohm meter until pressure is applied. And then the needle will move towards zero. Now, if nothing happens, replace the switch. If the switch fails to close, the ECM will receive no signal and will not ground the TCC circuit. However, when the switches and other members of the circuit are working properly, the ECM will activate the TCC solenoid. Now, you can monitor the various components of the circuit during a road test with your Tech 1 scanner. However, keep in mind 
that when the tech one says the TCC is applied, all it's really telling you is that the ECM grounds the circuit. The clutch itself may or may not be engaging. The torque converter clutch solenoid is located over here on the other side of the valve body. When the TCC apply circuit is complete, a signal activates the solenoid which moves a check ball underneath it in the valve body. Now, this check ball blocks the passage where oil normally flows and redirects the flow to the TCC apply valve. This, in turn, applies the torque converter clutch. Now, you can check the TCC apply solenoid with an ohmmeter, too. A good solenoid will be 20 ohms or more when measured across the terminals. It should be replaced if found defective. Oh, and also, take a good look at the O-ring. Leakage around it can be a cause of shift complaints. Well, that was a good question, because this turned out to be a simple overview on what the system is, what some of the components are, and some tests that you can do. Everybody follow that, right? Good. Okay, how about another question? Sure. Can you give us some tips for chuggle diagnosis related to torque converter clutch application? So, you've had some of those complaints, have you? <laughs> well, first of all, you should probably realize that Sometimes there'll be cases when there'll be a slight amount of chuggle that you just won't be able to get rid of. And that's just part of the nature of wet clutch transaxles. But there are certainly some diagnosis steps I can show you. Let's take a look at another videotape that I just happened to have, okay? Now, if the customer complaint and your inspection reveals such things as lower than expected gas mileage or transmission overheating or the check engine light coming on. Maybe the torque converter clutch is not applying at all. Now of course you need to determine whether it's an electrical circuit problem or a mechanical defect, right? In order to check the operation of the torque converter clutch circuit, install a tachometer and place it in the vehicle so you'll be able to read it while driving. Now, what you want to do is drive the car and control the application of the torque converter clutch. Using a grounded test light, probe terminal F of the ALDL connector to activate the circuit and apply the clutch. Another way of doing this test is with a jumper wire with a toggle switch spliced into the middle of it. The hookup is the same as the test light method, but by using the switch, you can activate the clutch while driving. Okay, what you're looking for here is about a 200 RPM drop. Now, of course, the best method is to use the Tech One scan tool, if you have one available, to monitor the data and activate the clutch. Consult the Tech One manual for the procedures. It's best if you drive the car until operating temperature is reached, and then select a road where you can maintain a steady highway speed at a light throttle load. Accelerate slowly and see if the clutch engages on its own. When the torque converter clutch is applied, you may feel a slight bump and see an RPM drop of about 200. Now, the Tech One screen will show when the TCC clutch applies and at what speed. And this is probably a good point for me to stop for a minute. Now, if the clutch won't activate on its own, then use one of the three methods I described to ground that ALDLF terminal and look for the RPM decrease. If the clutch still doesn't apply, you have to check the hydraulic apply circuit. Okay? To check the TCC hydraulic system, tee in a pressure gauge to either one of the cooling lines of the transaxle. Now this test is probably best performed on a hoist rather than on the road. Drive the car as you did on the road test and ground the ALDLF terminal. This time, you should see a pressure change on the gauge when the clutch is applied. Now if not, the problem is probably in the hydraulic circuit and you'll have to disassemble the transaxle to investigate. Don't forget to support the vehicle's lower control arms so the drive axles are at the proper angle. And if you find that you have to go into the hydraulic system to solve this problem, 
Pay particular attention to the pressure regulator valve. It could be sticking in the valve body. Other possibilities include a leaking TCC solenoid O-ring, a torn or mispositioned valve body gasket, or perhaps a damaged TCC accumulator piston seal. Of course, consult your Buick service manuals, diagnosis charts, and schematic diagrams for more detailed information. Okay? Good. Next question. Okay. Yeah. I'm still not sure about the differences between the modulator, throttle valve, and the governor pressure. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about testing these specific parts? Okay. Uh, it can be difficult keeping all the hydraulic components and pressure straight. Uh, let me see if I can give you a couple tips. All right. These are the three major components that allow shifts to occur smoothly and at the right time. Let's take a look at each one individually and we'll start with the modulator. Okay, the vacuum modulator controls shift feel by sensing changes in engine load. Now, we know that engine vacuum drops as load increases. The modulator is connected to the engine by a vacuum hose. And when it senses vacuum changes, like heavy load conditions, it boosts mainline pressure in the valve body. This controls the shift quality for firmer band and clutch applications. Okay, everybody still with me? Good. Now, if shift feel is the complaint, check the modulator diaphragm. Now this, of course, is assuming you've done an engine performance check during your preliminary inspection and know that an adequate supply of vacuum is reaching the modulator. It has to be 13 to 17 inches of mercury at idle. First, turn the modulator canister so the vacuum connector faces down. If any fluid drains out, this indicates a ruptured diaphragm. Replace the modulator. Another way to check the diaphragm is with a hand vacuum pump. Simply attach the pump to the modulator vacuum hose connection and pump the vacuum to 15 to 20 inches. The modulator plunger should be drawn in and the modulator should hold vacuum for 30 seconds. If neither occurs, replace the modulator. Now, you can test for external leakage on the modulator canister by, apply, by applying soap solution to the modulator. And then attach a short piece of vacuum hose to the modulator and blow into the hose. If you see any bubbles, it means the canister seam is leaking and the modulator should be replaced. Oh, and one thing, don't use compressed air and you don't need to blow very hard. A quick puff of air is all that's necessary. If the previous tests are okay, do a load test. Now, for that, you need a modulator checking tool, J36619, and a known good modulator. Place the known good modulator on one side of the tool and the modulator to be tested on the other. Holding the assembly level, slowly push the two modulators together. If the gauge line remains blue, the modulator is not acceptable. If the gauge line is white, the modulator is okay. Now, to check sleeve alignment, roll the modulator on a flat surface and observe the concentricity of the sleeve with the can. Misalignment can cause plunger binding or fluid leakage. This one's not very good. All right, any questions about the things I just went over? Good. Okay, before we move on, let me get rid of some of this stuff, though. And put that there. All right. Now, what do you say we talk about modular, modulator related complaints? Okay, pretty self explanatory. Modulator related complaints, that's not uh, a total list either. We'll touch on some of the other ones later as we go along. But for now, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the throttle valve. Now, as you all know, the throttle valve controls shift speeds through a mechanical cable from the engine throttle to the valve in the valve body. This is the throttle valve. 
Now, it's very important that it moves freely in the bore. The adjustment at the engine throttle, which we talked about during the preliminary inspection segment, is critical. If the linkage movement is too much or too little, the shift speeds will be too high or too low. Let's take a brief look at the governor system since it's related to the throttle valve system. Governor pressure and throttle pressure work against each other in the valve body. While the TV pressure increases with engine speed, governor pressure increases with vehicle speed. The governor is connected directly to the transaxle output shaft, so it senses vehicle speed. Governor pressure increases as vehicle speed increases. Let's look at a schematic. And the schematic is, yeah, that one right there. Now if you study this picture, you'll see the tug of war, or rather push of war, that goes on between TV pressure and governor pressure. TV pressure pushes as engine speed increases during acceleration, and governor pressure pushes back as vehicle road speed increases. These pressure differentials are what cause the shift valves to move. Now, I know that's just a brief description of how shifts occur. If you want to review it in more detail, you'll know how reference manual is a good place to start. Oh, and one last thing about the governor. Sometimes you may find it necessary to flush the governor hydraulic circuit. If so, an effective way to do it on the car is to remove the governor assembly, replace the cover, and start the engine. Run the transaxle and D for, oh, say, 15 to 20 seconds, and then stop the engine and replace the governor. Be sure to test drive the car. By the way, be especially careful when handling the vehicle speed sensor. The electrical leads are especially delicate, and you can really get yourself in trouble with them. So, let's see. Oh, yeah, don't forget your service manual, service bulletins, and the know-how program on shift complaints for any additional help. Let's see what time we have. Okay, I think we've got time for about one more question. Anybody? Yes. How do you know when to do a full service repair on a transaxle or to use a SERTA unit? Okay, I can answer that question for you. Talk about SERTA units. Oh, wait a minute, I got a better idea. I think I've got some worksheets here. Yep. If you think there's the possibility of a SERTA situation, just use one of these worksheets. All you have to do, they're very simple and self-explanatory, just fill out the labor that you think you're going to use and the parts you think you're going to use, total it up, and compare that to the cost of a SERTA unit and labor. Oh, and of course, don't forget that with any sort of replacement or transaxle overhaul, the transaxle cooler and lines should be flushed using the proper equipment, like this J35994 flushing tool. I'll leave this out here so you can take a look at it. Well, I don't know about you, but I think this is a good time for a break. And when you get back, we'll do some hands-on stuff, okay? All right, take a break.